Let's look on now at the closing section of this, and then we'll move on to the new material. We come to the conclusion of this study on the local church that there are two alternatives, and I would add only two. I would add also that they're mutually exclusive. You cannot have both. You must have one or the other. And each contains a many and a one. It just depends where you put the many and where you put the one. The present generally accepted pattern is number one, many local churches, each with one leader. God's order is different. It's one local church with many leaders. You must have unity. You must have plurality. The question is, where do you put them? God does not authorize nor accept plurality of churches within an area. Nor does he authorize or accept unity of leadership within the church. God's order is unity of the church, plurality of leadership. Man has turned that upside down and introduced plurality of churches with singular leadership. And actually, the one excludes the other. They are mutually exclusive. And I stand here before you today as a witness that whether you wish it or not, you're being faced with a choice and a decision. The book of Joel is the book that pictures in outline this latter-day restoration, and it has three phases, going more or less according to the chapters, one, two, and three. The first is desolation, the second is restoration, third is judgment on those that reject restoration. And in Joel chapter 3, verse 14, this is the picture of judgment. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Do you know what the valley of decision is? It's the place to which God brings people that they never can get out again till they've made a decision. The valley of decision is the place where you've got to say yes or no and there's no third answer. And that's where the church is coming on this map. The church has got to decide, does it want to follow its own ways and its own practices or does it wish to submit to the clearly defined and stated pattern of God in Scripture? You cannot have it both ways. And I feel that I'm here as a witness to this area that the time has come to make a choice. I believe that. As I stand here, I feel a certain sense of divine sanction on that statement. You are confronted with a decision. The time of going to church and sitting in the pew and going through sweet religious exercises is closing. And now the time for action and reality is here. Now I'm going to go on and the material contained in the second, or really it's the fifth outline. We'll do a little more review and then we're going to come to one final thing which will take me a little while. Now I'm summing up in this chart the picture of the five ministries set side by side. There are two lines of division. One is vertical and the other is horizontal. The vertical line is between the mobile and the resident. The horizontal line is between those which are always plural and those which may be singular. Let's take the vert vertical line of division first. The mobile, there are four mobile ministries. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers. They are ministries to the whole body of Jesus Christ at any time, in any place, as the Spirit of God directs. The resident ministries are actually just one, though we have all these names up here. They're all names to one. Shepherds, who are also called pastors, overseers, who are also called bishops, and elders, who also function as local teachers, not as teachers to the whole body, but as teachers to their own particular congregation. So there is the difference. Now, taking the dividing line horizontally, above this line, the ministries that are shown always operate in the plural. It is always apostles together. It is always prophets together. 
and it is always a group of men who collectively are the leadership of the local congregation. The one man, one congregation system is not scriptural. There is not a single example of it in the New Testament. See, neither you nor I can rewrite the New Testament. That's finished. It's closed. We just have to decide whether we want to accept it or reject it. Below this line, this horizontal line, there are the two ministries that are found operating individually, the evangelist and the teacher. Philip, the evangelist, went down to Samaria alone. Apollos, the teacher, was sent to Achaia by the church in Ephesus alone. Now, I have offered a suggestion as to the difference which is found in these words, church order. The ministries that will relate directly to the order of the church, apostles, prophets, and shepherds, are always plural, because God never trusts one man alone with that responsibility. The safeguard is plurality. And then those men together have to come into harmony through the Holy Spirit, concerning the will of God. That's God's faith God to present any, prevent any one person becoming a dictator over the flock of Jesus Christ. There are no dictators in the church of Jesus Christ. Here, the evangelist and teacher have vital ministry, but they are not in that ministry directly concerned with church order. So that is a picture of the relationship, the difference between the mobile and the resident, the difference between those ministries which are always plural and those which may, be, may function in the singular. Now we're going to deal with just one more question, and it's a very, very interesting one, and that is how, in practice, do the two pictures of the local church relate to one another? And you will see that on the left-hand side I have man's view, and on the right-hand side I've left a blank, which I'm going to try to fill up with God's view. This is as best I am able to understand. Here is how man looks at a city area. The extent of the area is unimportant. It's not relevant to what we're talking about. Now, when, and I've only given you a few examples. When man looks, he sees them bees. You know what bees are? Baptists. And then he sees them see. You know what bees are? They're Catholic. And then he sees some E. You know what they are? Episcopalian. Don't feel left out if I haven't included you. I just only had room for a certain number, and I chose the ones that are fairly well known. He chose, he sees some peas. The peas are Presbyterian. Then there are also some peas backward. You know what they are? They're Pentecostal. All right. Now, in some places, you have um, a pea frontwards, and a P backwards together. That's a Presbyterian married to a Pentecostal. And you see, they're facing one another. They get on quite well together in spite of their denominational differences. Down here somewhere, yes, we have a, we have a P that's forwards, a Presbyterian, with a P that's backwards. But they're back to back. They can't resolve their differences. There, there is complete disharmony between them. Now, accepting these labels, and with due apologies to those that got left out, what man does is he tries to tie all the Baptists together into one group. See, they've all got to go to the Baptist church. So we take a line and we... Now, I may not be able to do this perfectly, but you'll get the idea. You draw it around all the Baptists. Like this. Where's the more Baptist? There's one down here. We've got to include him. Oh, and there's two down here. We've got to include them. Where are some more? There's some over here. So we go up here, and then we go along here, and we include these two. See that? And these. Now, we mustn't miss out any Baptists, otherwise the Baptist church wouldn't be complete, see? But you have to go around this P backwards, which is a Pentecostal, because he wouldn't want to be included. Well, there you are. Now, you see, the trouble is we've got a C in there by accident. All right? Well, now we'll take the C's. They're pretty widely distributed. So we've got C's here, C's here, C's here, and we come around here, and we've got a big blob of C's there, 
We've got one little C over here all on his own, but he's a very staunch Catholic. And we've got another C over here on his own. He has to be included in the C's. And then you've got to come back the way you started with the C's like that. Well, then, of course, you've got the Episcopalians, mainly in the rather upper-class districts. And uh, you have them here and here. And then there's a big nest of Episcopalians here, down here, which you've got to include, and two more up here, and another one there, and you come back on yourself here, and you've got the Episcopalian church, see? Well, then we got the Presbyterians, so we start up here, and we have to look out for some more, there's two more there, and there's one here, we've got to divide here between this married couple, because one's a Presbyterian, the other's Pentecostal, see? And uh, yes, two more Presbyterians here. Keep that Pentecostal outside. And here we are down with two Presbyterians here. And we carefully steer clear of those Pentecostals there, mind you. And here we are. We've got the Presbyterian Church. Now, I don't know who to pick out the Pentecostal. There's a couple here. All right. And there's one over here, marriage with Presbyterian. We've got to include him or her. And then there's another one, marriage with Presbyterian here. We've got to include that one. And then there's a couple of Pentecostals down here that got left out of the previous. And I'm sure there must be another Pentecostal somewhere. Oh, yes, there's two over here, see? So by the time you've finished, that's what it looks like. Now, I don't know what you think that looks like, but I think it looks a mess. And I'll tell you, it was meant to look a mess. And in God's sight, that sight that's what it is. It's the mess. And I mean, that's only a little part of the mess, because you've got to add about 20 other denominations, and all the end you've got is a black blurb. Now you say, Brother Prince, what's the alternative? Well, I'm going to offer you a suggestion. Now, I want you to understand that my suggestion is just a, an elementary, idealistic pattern type. It's not my suggestion that would ever actually operate this particular way. We imagine a city area divided up into four main sub-areas, and each sub-area subdivided into four smaller areas. So you have altogether 16 sub-areas. Now the Spirit of God begins to move, and people are born again and come into, into being as Christians all over the place. Now each blob is a Christian. And so we have Christians coming up all over the place. Now I'm only just doing a few out of the many possible... See, this is just typical... There's a real revival in the northwest section up there. A lot of people have come to the Lord. Then it spreads to the northeast section. We have Christians coming up here, 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 all around. Now this goes on until the whole city has become influenced by what God is doing. There's a, there's a move of God. So we have twos and threes and fours and fives and then big house groups growing up all around the area. Now, out of these who are just disciples, the Holy Spirit will begin to bring forth natural local leadership. It never takes long in any group there will always be some that will begin to display a greater sense of responsibility, mature more rapidly, and emerge as leaders. So we'll fill in the leaders as complete black blobs. You understand? So the filled in blobs are leaders. They're amongst their brethren, they're in the fellowship, but they have displayed capacity for leadership. And pretty soon they begin to be recognized. In other words, when Sister Jane has a terrible fever in the middle of the night, she just phones her brother Bob almost automatically. That's indicating the fact that she's really treating him as an elder, for it says, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. We'll put in a few more people here.
All right. Now you'll see. No, you won't, because I'm not finished. But basically, you'll see what I'm after. This is an idealized pattern. But in every subsection of that city, there have emerged two local leaders. They're operating within their group in each case, but they have capacity for leadership. Now let's suppose that these local groups all meet on Tuesday night. Let me suggest something to you. It's a good thing if you have a lot of prayer groups in an area, have them all meet the same night. You know why? Because then people can't hop from group to group. They've got to make a commitment. You see, the people that never make any commitment are never worth anything. It isn't a spiritual cocktail party that you drop in on when you feel inclined. It's a group that's being knitted together in fellowship to be brought into harmony to do business with Almighty God. And so, we in our area of Southeast Florida have a general principle that people that have home prayer groups will have them on Tuesday night. So everybody has got to make a commitment to the prayer group that he feels the Lord is leading him to. All right, so the prayer groups are meeting now all over the city Tuesday night. But leadership has emerged. Now, the real key to this thing working, whatever way you arrive at it, is this. It's fellowship amongst the local leaders. Without fellowship amongst the local leaders, there cannot really be any effective fellowship amongst the local believers. But when the local leaders will come into fellowship regularly with one another, then the barrier to the fellowship of the believers is taken out of the way. It all depends on the local leaders coming into fellowship. So what we picture now is that amongst themselves, in each of the four main sections of the city, the local leaders say, we'll meet Monday night to have a leaders meeting. We'll discuss our problems, we'll level with one another, we'll be open, it won't be just a, a talking session, but we'll really get the grips with our own personal problems, the problems of our flock, we'll share one another's needs in prayer, we'll exchange revelations, we'll check everything we're doing with the opinion of our fellow leaders. So, in the center of this area here, there comes into being a fellowship of leaders. And every Monday night, these people come together in a leaders' meeting. All right, what have you got there? You've got eight leaders meeting every Monday, going back every Tuesday and leading their own local group. Now, this patterns all over. The same thing. You get the leaders coming in Monday night. I do not need to tell you that this is highly idealized, but it just gives you an idea of how it actually can be done. Everywhere, these people who are black, who are leaders, Monday night, they come together so that they're ready to meet the spiritual needs of their own group Tuesday night. Now, in every one of the four sections of that city, you have eight men meeting regularly every week on a Monday night as a fellowship of leaders. They exchange their problems, their needs, their revelations, their ideas on doctrine. No man acts on his own. It's the collective mind of the group that is the final arbiter of decisions and doctrines and so on. It's we have the mind of Christ, not I am in charge of my own little group and nobody told me what to do, brother. All right, now then, we just go one step further. In the center of this city, we draw another bigger square. Like that. Now, the first Monday of every month, once a month, these four groups of local leaders meet in one big leaders group. And what do you have meeting every Monday? If my mathematics are right, you have 32 leaders meeting. 
Every other Monday in the month, they meet eight at a time. Every Tuesday, they are leading their own group. But there is no division whatever of the body of Christ. They are all in fellowship. They all acknowledge one another. And there is no barrier between this group meeting and having fellowship with that group. You see, at the moment, it is a pitiful fact that in many cases, members of one church are almost forbidden to fellowship with members of another church. Now, I do not believe that God has given any man the authority to make that kind of decree. I believe it is bringing division into the body of Christ, and I believe it is anathema to the Lord. So here is the way it can develop. And it's obvious, I think you'll see, that this principle will apply no matter how big the area. Uh, it doesn't matter the size of the area. People say, how big is a city? Is Pittsburgh one city? I said, that is a matter of practical decision on the basis of the situation, transportation, the number of believers, many different factors, and ultimately... The leaders, as a group, get the mind of the Holy Spirit. Where do we draw the line? Now, this group here, 32, is in a position to act collectively on behalf of the whole city. The city needs an evangelistic impact. They can collectively inv invite an evangelist. The city needs a teaching seminar. They invite the teachers to this seminar. You see, Jesus said, I am the shepherd and I am the door. And in a very vital sense, the shepherds are the door to the congregation. And in actual fact, when the church is functioning properly, mobile ministries such as mine will not come to an area unless they come through the door, which is the shepherd leaders. Actually, we have come to this area on the invitation of local leaders. And we told the local leaders very specifically, if you don't invite us, we will not come. We will not come as a thief forcing our way in by some other way than the door. But you know and I know that all over the United States there are many wolves in sheep's clothing who are thieves and robbers who spoil the sheep, who are forcing their way in, fleecing the sheep, leading them astray, creating endless problems. There's only one solution. It's the collective leadership of the city. When 32 respected men get together and say, now don't go to those meetings, that man is preaching do false doctrine, he's living with another man's wife, it cannot be right, then there's authority. But while every little man is a pope in his own group, there is no collective authority. And the wolves will continue to come in and spoil the flock until the leaders get together. I was in a meeting recently, invited with about 35 other mobile ministries by the charismatic presbytery of the city of Seattle to a conference to bring the mobile ministries together. In the city of Seattle, for about two years, what is now a group of about 40 members, leaders of churches in the area, have been meeting regularly in fellowship. And out of that fellowship has developed a sense of unity and ability to cooperate together so that they could invite 40 charismatic mobile ministries to that city, of which I had the privilege to be one. And that gathering of those men made a greater impact on the city of Seattle, according to the testimony of local ministers, than any evangelistic campaign ever held in Seattle. And as I was meditating upon this, the Lord asked me this question. He said, now tell me this. Whom did I have more trouble with, the city of Nineveh or the prophet Jonah? And I said, Lord, when you got Jonah straightened out, you had no problems with Nineveh. And he said, it's exactly the same today. If I can get the leadership straightened out, I'll have no problems with the city. This, I believe, is the divine pattern. Shall we bow in prayer? Father, we praise you and thank you that you love us, that you care for us, that you gave the Lord Jesus to die on the cross and to rise from the dead, to be the shepherd and bishop of our soul. And by an act of our will, collectively as a group, we submit ourselves to the discipline and the authority of the one who is the shepherd of the sheep, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that in this area you will touch many and speak to many, some who are already in the shepherd ministry and others who are feeling that they're being drawn into it and that thou will bring together in this area a fellowship of local leaders that shall represent the believer and stand on their behalf. In Jesus' name we pray and all the people stand. Amen.